Thomas Triber. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has arrived for Inside Boxing Weekly. So here are your hosts, Mike Goodpaster, John Einreinhofer, and Jeremiah Pricer on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Welcome, everybody, to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Inside Boxing Weekly is brought to you by MyBookie.ag. Make sure you go to MyBookie.ag banner at thegruelingtruth.com. Click on it, and you'll get up to a 100% bonus on your first deposit, up to $300. Um, also, we are brought to you by the Retired Boxers Foundation. Alex Ramos, Jackie Richardson do a great job there. And also Seat Giant, which you can go to Seat Giant and put in the promo code LEGEND to get a 10% discount on your purchase. I am your co-host for Inside Boxing Weekly, Mike Goodpaster. And right now, I'd like to welcome in my two co-hosts. First up, Jeremiah Pricer. How you doing, Jeremiah? Oh, man, I'm always good. It's good to have John on finally. Let's talk some boxing, fellas. All right. And our other co-host, he hadn't been on for a while because that's been because he's been working as a shill for PBC on Twitter. Help me welcome to the show, John Heidreinhofer. <laughs> good, good to be here, Mike. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, interesting how all, it's interesting how all the, uh, how, how the Dodd shills get accused by paid writers. Uh, by paid are they, writers are they paying show. you well, John? I'm not, I'm not getting paid as good probably as the guys that are on the attack. I'll, I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's start off and let's talk a little bit about, you know, this has been a while where it's been running ESPN Plus, The Zone, Showtime, all this. Um, give me your initial thoughts on all this. Which one is the best deal and which one is not the best deal from what you've seen so far, Jeremiah? Well, I mean, it's, it's, for me, I mean, it's tough. You know, the best deal, I think, is PBC. I mean, uh, you know, you just get some, some good fights on free TV every once in a while. It seems like they've kind of layered it to where, you know, the best of the best stuff, uh, you know, you're getting on one, you're getting on PBC Fox, you know, and then you get, the you know, kind of the last level stuff more on Showtime. You know, I just like the fact that they're, they're, they're trying to put some of this stuff on free TV I think it's the best route to go. You got to get this in front of people, and then second place. It's kind of it's kind of tough to say. I mean, it's like ESPN has gotten lucky a little bit with some of their some of their cards that have turned out a little bit better than you would have thought. I mean, you do get to watch guys like Crawford and Lomachenko. I mean, it is only four ninety nine a month, but a lot of these cards are also stinkers, just like most of the ones, you know. And then you got the zone where you have to pay a little bit more, you know. But it's an it's an app, and it doesn't have a lot of subscribership, you know. So. In the end, I, I do think PBC has the best model going on. Um, but, you know, for second place, it's, just, it's tough right now. I mean, again, ESPN is cheaper. The zone's a little more expensive. But I, I like what the zone has been giving me lately, you know, and this, that's just kind of the way the game is right now. It's like, you know, what, what are you actually putting on? You know, and with, the, you know, the fight we're going to talk about coming up this weekend, possibility of a third fight between, you know, this guy and another guy. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the zone seems like you're getting the better value, especially if you include the World Boxing Super Series. But, uh, you know, ESPN still has yet to fill out their card for the year, and I'm just not exactly sure. All right, John. Yeah, I think, like it or not, Mike, it's, it's a big topic. Um, you know, I, I I agree basically with Jeremiah, um, you know, and I think it is worth clarifying because we've got all these Twitter wars going on and and, you know, you get to talk more, of course, on the podcast to, to get a little more detail into your thoughts. That's a good time to do it. Um, my, my feeling was from the beginning, and we have been doing this show long enough, it goes back pretty close to that, and certainly are all posting this stuff on Facebook. Does. For me, PBC, when they were at least making that attempt, and they had to start it out with the time by, you know, the sport was fading, dying out, even though we're all fans, hardcore followers. That, that's just a reality. I mean, I don't think you're being negative. I think you're just stating the facts. And, you know, PBC got the, you know, that got my interest back up for somebody trying to do something. 
try to get more viewers involved. And, and look, when people were attacking them when they did that, nobody thought that they boxing would ever get a time buy on network TV, excuse me, a, a rights fee deal on network TV again. And they achieved that. I think that was a real good thing. They held off on uh, pay-per-view for a long time, and they put on the uh, the Thurman Porter and the Thurman Garcia on CBS for free. You know, I, th- I think that was all good stuff. You, you got you got now a little heavier on the PP, pay-per-view. The fights were uh, competitive going in. They didn't, you know, except for Wilder Fury, they didn't work out that good. But uh, I think that even though they're still – some flaws to it. Some of the matchups aren't as good as I would like. I think that's the best potential model, like Jeremiah said, if they don't get too pay-per-view heavy. And then one thing, when these wars started up, when then ESPN got back into it, which was a good thing for boxing, I mean, they got back into it seriously, and then the zone popped up, is what I've gotten sucked into is something I swore I didn't want to when that started out, which is we're just going to have to end up paying more with more subscription services because Showtime's still around, and and I've taken the plunge now at this point uh, because when you're following the sport, you kind of need to. I, I'm planning for it, hopefully, not to be indefinitely that I've been suckered in. But, you know, I've got ESPN Plus now. I went with the DAZN $100 plan recently, which comes out to 833 a month. Again, not liking necessarily having to pay more stuff, but figuring, you know, we got Canelo Jacobs this weekend, had a good card last Friday night, and – uh, you know, if maybe you get a maybe a, a Golovkin Canelo three, something like that, one other good fight might be worth it. I really don't like it though. I like the P, the PBC model better. I think it'd be better for the sport if that worked. So I'm looking at it now as the ESPN Plus, the DAZN. Going to take a look here for a year or so and 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 see what they deliver after a year. If it was false promises or if they're going to deliver some value. But, um, you know, Mike, we've talked about this. Uh, even though these guys are good fighters, I think when you look at the sport, especially in the U.S., some people take this the wrong way, but I still think it's a reality. You know, even though it was a good fight, Estradas saw Rung Visai at an alphabet-created 115-pound weight class. is not going to drive boxing in the U.S. Uh, it's just not going to happen. So those cards are good to see for boxing hardcore fans, but – but I don't think that they're going to move the needle in terms of the interest of growing the sport or anything like that. All right. Jeremiah, you agree, disagree? Or? No, I, th- I think he's right. I mean, again, this is – I mean, it's really a numbers game. I mean, if you well, want – See, this is the thing, growth, though. You... It, when you look at this, Jeremiah, um, with the zone – I have found that I think I've gotten more value for my nine ninety nine a month than I have from ESPN on my four ninety nine. Well, I, I think you can say that again. I mean, I, I can't recall anybody else putting on a, a weekend like the Zone just had. You know, I mean, again, we'll we'll end up talking about the fights, but you know, you had three good ones on Friday. Uh, you had, uh, you know, the Nonito Donaire fight. It was okay. I mean, it wasn't terrible. I mean, it was a sub, so, you know, that was unfortunate. But, you know, you got to see Pro Gray in action, and he looked really good. And, I mean, just in terms of what you got last weekend, I mean, uh, I much prefer that to the, you know, the Crawford Con pay-per-view that we had talked about off-air and, and a lot of other things that have happened. I mean, the, you know, the, the headliners with Gilberto Ramirez and the new one that they just announced with Oscar Valdez. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, it seems like the zone is doing a pretty good job so far. I mean, and, and I've, a lot of these cards I've watched from top to bottom. I remember when they had, um, it was, it was pro Gray's first fight in the WBSS and the actually the, through and through the card was pretty good. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it is, I, I think you're right that the zone is offering the best value, but again, when we're going back to, you know, how this pushes the bill and how it advances the sport, I just, it just doesn't seem like it is. And we've already talked about that. The zone is not necessarily, you know, banking on boxing being part of their long-term model anyways. I mean, again, this could all just be a, a ploy to get subscribers so they can get the rights to the big sport. So, uh, you know, I'm just a little iffy with the zone and ESPN. I mean, partly ESPN as well, because uh, I mean, they've been dealing with boxing for many, many years and it's like, they already know what's up with the game. You know, it's it, remember they used to put on, uh, maybe people are, might not remember, but they put on pay-per-view fights law a long time ago. Remember they did uh, Shane Mosley versus um, 
uh, who was it, Estrada, I think. David, they had a card that had David Kermit Estrada. Centron on it, too, I think, that was a pay-per-view card, didn't they, John? I, I, yeah, I believe that's not, I believe that's not that was a rematch. To tell you the truth, until you guys brought that up, I had kind of forgotten about that because <clears> even ESPN themselves were marketing Crawford Con like this was their first venture into you it. You didn't but pay for that, did you, John? Jogging. No, I did not. Okay, I'm just checking. And I'm proud to say. I'm were you like me, though, was... and you almost did until you talked yourself out of it? I've done that with a lot, Mike. We laughed about some of the ones in the past. That one had me so infuriated, and I got a lot of arguments on Twitter about this with people, and I, I kind of feel, frankly, like I won, like with other people, I, I won this argument. Um, you know, Crawford Khan was at it, and you guys agreed because we've talked about this on the show. Crawford Khan was on a different level of bad. In other words, even when you just looked at the odds, it wasn't like Pacquiao Broner, which had Brown Jack on the undercard, or Spence Garcia, or Wilder Fury. It was on a different level of bad, and all the underdog fights had like minus, excuse me, undercard fights, had like minus 2,000 favorites. And that was the kind of pay-per-view that was driving boxing into the gutter. So I just felt that, you know, you, you want to see some of the stuff, but that, that one just really just bothered me on the whole principle of it. Well, and uh, I, think, I think this, John and Jeremiah, that the best thing for boxing would be if these organizations would put their best fighters against each other. And I don't think it matters what the TV model is right now. Until they do that, at least occasionally, nothing's going to get any better. Yeah, and I actually think, um, I think, uh, you know, John, you know, he's familiar with him, but I think Kurt Emhoff has a decent idea when it comes to all of this stuff. And, you know, this kind of works around the Muhammad Ali Act, and you don't have to deal with so much of the red tape. Uh, you know, not, you don't have to try to create a centralized organization. But his idea is for all these promoters to work together and put on a tournament format, kind of like the WBSS, where, you know, every three years or so, you would, you know, you'd, you could do what you want in the meantime, and then when those three years come around, you know, the, the best of the best in each division. I, I don't know, if, I can't remember exactly what it was, whether or not he wanted it everybody in every division to do it every three i think you would you would you would work the years cyclically or you know where you where one year you would have certain kinds of divisions and then the next year you would have certain kinds of divisions and then again it would be a revolving door uh you know of, of these tournament formats and you you know you get the best the best of these guys fighting and again i think we even talked about it on air before but you, you know you think of it that the betting revenue that it would generate. I mean, you'd have something like, you know, boxing sweet 16. I mean, again, it's not going to generate that sort of excitement, but in the long term, I think that would be a pretty good idea. But again, it, it's a matter of getting these guys together and, you know, putting them at the, the negotiation table. And it just doesn't, it seems so unlikely because, you know, again, Bob Arum, I mean, he's been, I mean, he had a lawsuit against Al Heyman, right? You know, said he violated the Muhammad Ali Act. Uh, you know, he's been talking a lot of shit about Eddie Hearn out in the open. So, I mean, a lot of these guys haven't – they haven't really gone to the table and played nice with one another, but uh, it would not, it would be nice to see it. Unfortunately, it just – it seems like a pipe dream right now. Yeah, and I think it's yeah. more than a pipe dream. I don't think it's ever going to happen. I, I've reached that point. I've, as I've said on our show, I've changed a little bit this year um, – you know, I my hope always was, and you know, Jeremiah and I always talk about. It, I still believe in it, but you know, that the driver be that you, you, and and this would be just a different way of looking at something like Kurt had looked at a possible solution. I, I had always hoped that you know you get something like transnational and or the ring, where you know the fans and people in boxing start to recognize those as the titles and and really just talk about that, and then the fighters follow along. And then you get rid of these organizations, basically, at least as a practical matter, and that forces the big fights that way. In other words, if you have a title that people truly care about, then the guys from different promotional entities are, want, are going to want to get that title. But I, what, what, what has led me to just kind of put that on hi- hiatus is that you, know, you have people who even follow the sport regularly that don't get it. They don't get that there's too many weight classes. They don't get that you can't have four – alphabet organizations recognizing champions and have any any sense made of it so uh i i think it's going to take first step maybe even though these aren't as good as 
fighters from different promotional outfits fighting each other, the, the best possible in-fight, in-house fights happening. I mean, if you really look under the radar, these promotional organizations don't even have their best fighters fighting each other, never mind fighting guys from well, the yeah, other Well, yeah, you don't want to risk them getting a loss. Right. They, don't, they, they, they just well, don't I... want to have any risk of taking a loss. Uh, they overrate that factor. And th- th- we need to start with that, at least say, hey, guys, you have these two guys. Have them fight each other now. I mean, there's no marinating. There's no the guy needs to get ready. And, again, fans, they, they, they get suckered into this. They say, well, the guy needs more time to get ready or it needs more time to marinate. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> if somebody, somebody loses, somebody Well, this loses. is the thing. Crawford and Spence should happen in September. And if it did, I think that's actually a fight that enough just pure boxing fans want to see that you might be able to hit a million pay-per-view on it. I think you could. Yeah, I, I don't see any reason why not with a fight like that, even in today's boxing climate. But I agree with you, Mike. They're not going to You know, I've reached that point now. I, I'm, they're not going to do it. Yeah, I think and Crawford would do it, John. But Errol Spence has so many other options where he can make a shitload of money over the next two years. Yeah, and I think that's true. I mean, they're just and, – and it's not like he's going to be fighting bad fighters. So they're No, just gonna go but they that need to fight each other. They should. I mean, in an ideal world, they should be fighting right now. Um, at least if all those other PBC guys fight, and again, we don't need any more, we don't need any marination with those matchups. Those guys just need to start fighting. Um, they could fight. And, and, you know, this is not what people are looking for, but, but this to me is, is part of the problem. You know, like I said, I mean, look, Craw- Crawford just fought Khan on a pay-per-view when, you know, they, they, again, I'm not saying Crawford's not going to beat him, but, you know, they got Jose Ramirez. You know, Cavalier Laskis, all right, he got held to the draw with Robinson. He looked bad. There's no doubt about it. But, but they, don't, they don't even have Crawford fighting the, the welterweights they've got available that have a pulse. You yeah. know, they're guys who could be fighting that welterweight. And, and that's the big part of the problem is that, you know, the, I mean, look at Jeremiah and I were both outraged on it. Look at the guy Valdez is going to fight next. I mean, that's top rank. They've got in-house options now. It counts as in-house because he's got to deal with Warren and ESPN. So he's got Frampton and Warrington available. They could fight tomorrow. And Valdez is going to fight a guy with three KOs that nobody's ever yeah. And then Warrington ever fighting Kid Galahad. And then Warrington's going to fight Kid Galahad. But is that he, not Elvis yeah. Presley? And does that not prove that he <laughs> didn't die in 1977? <laughs> I mean, who, 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 in the US, who in the U.S. is a Kid Galahad? I mean, when I think of Kid Galahad, I think of the Elvis movie or the original movie back in, what, the 30s? But I I don't want to see that. And boxing is so messed up now that, and we've had the debate on steroids before, and my point is, is either let everybody do it or start banning these guys for life when they do it. And we had Jarrell Miller, who ruined a perfectly good June the 1st by inserting Andy Ruiz in, which actually... I think with the options, is probably not that bad a fight compared to what they could have done because Manuel Char, we were afraid, would get that shot. But Darrell yeah, Miller, Darrell Miller's fat ass. Uh, I think now we know why maybe he survived when he was fat as hell and, you know, mm-hmm. usually should be on oxygen in the fifth round. And Well, that's true, yeah. They, they suspend him for six months, John. I mean, and the that's problem with this accurate. is it goes back to Canelo. It goes back to anybody that's tested for this, but especially you go Canelo, six months later, he gets to fight the same fight. It doesn't cost him any money. And I think that that sets a bad precedent for all the other fighters who think, well, hell, he got away with it. It didn't really cost him that much. Maybe I should just go ahead and give it a shot. Yeah, I mean, the Canelo situation had some unique things to it. But... No, it didn't. He tested positive. He did test positive. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But it was in a strict liability situation. No, he tested positive, John. And if you test positive, you should be out. That's the way. I mean, this is something that it's either everybody should be allowed to do it or nobody should. And you know what? You know what you put in your body. It's your fault. I mean, I don't care what his excuse is because, let's face it, everybody. Jarrell Miller even had an excuse until he tested positive two more times a day later. So I, I just don't care. I don't care what the reason is. There's no reason to test positive for it. You're a professional athlete, Jeremiah. You've got to know what you're putting in your body. 
Well, yeah, and I, and I think these guys are pretty well aware. I mean, you know, a lot of this is, you know, the science and whatnot of sports anymore has become, uh, or I mean, the diet of, of sports anymore has become a science. I mean, you know, these guys are, I remember when Canelo was fighting, you know, Floyd Mayweather Jr. and he had to drop an extra couple pounds and he's like, damn, I'm so sick of eating uh, fish and cucumbers every night. You know, I mean, they, these guys have it down to a science now. They, they know what they're doing, you know. But but that's the thing is I mean with Darrell Miller six months and it's not even the thing about it is because he was not licensed by the New York State Athletic Commission this is a sentence handed down just by the WBA and that's right. right so so that's this is not problem. some universal yeah this is not some universal suspension uh, you know Gilberto Mendoza Jr. the WBA he also said that. Uh, you know, if Miller wants to come back, he's got to sign up for VADA testing, right? He's got to do random. But, I mean, this is the problem with boxing. This is the thing, you know, John, it's kind of to John's point where he's talking about how even, you know, writers of the sport, hardcore followers of the game, don't get it. It's like, okay, right. look, look at where this is leading us now, okay? So the WBA is saying, hey, you know what? You can't fight for us. Okay, well, how about what if he just goes and goes for the IBF? Right, or goes down, goes for the WBC, or or goes for the you know the uh, uh, WBO, right? I mean, it, it, there are just too many avenues to walk down where he can be you know free and clear of whatever he's done. And, and we talked about this on air, Mike, about how uh, you know a six month suspension it's a slap on the wrist. A lot of you know you see some people on Twitter like, oh well, he lost it, he lost lost out on six million dollars. Yeah, maybe temporarily. Yeah, but you know uh, what, I mean, Jeremiah. He's going to be, not to interrupt you, even though I am, but I think that this will affect him negatively because I don't think he was looked upon as a hero. Canelo Alvarez, let's go back. Evander Holyfield, Floyd Mayweather with the IV. Um, you go to other sports. I mean, Peyton Manning, which the HGH delivered to his house, but it's supposedly his wife's, which was proven. She had no condition that would have needed that. We see athletes. <laughs> it's good, you guys, but it is hilarious because Andy Pettit did the same thing and they make excuses for him. It's ridiculous. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. When you are a popular athlete, there's excuses and people ignore it. When you're Barry Bonds and everybody takes you as an asshole, they will eat you up for it. Mark McGuire's coaching in baseball again. Barry Bonds probably wouldn't be allowed near a baseball field. So the problem is this, Darrell Miller could possibly be ruined by this. But if Anthony Joshua or Deontay Wilder were to test positive, eh, six months later, they're going to fight and make the same amount of money. Everybody's going to make an excuse. And that's just the way it is. Darrell Miller does not get the leeway that these big-time popular guys who bring in the money, because let's face it, Darrell Miller doesn't bring in the money. He'll be, but he'll be back if he'll be back. That's how bad it has gotten. Yeah, he'll but be he'll back be back, and... but he's going to be paid less until he proves himself. A guy like Canelo or Vander Holyfield, come on, Vander Holyfield, everybody knew did this stuff. Manny Pacquiao, come on, is there anybody that doesn't believe that a guy that started off fighting at like 10 pounds can move all the way up to, you know, junior middleweight or whatever it is and kick everybody's ass is clean? They're not clean. But everybody loves him, so we'll let it go. Well, well, look, well, look. So, so wrong, so wrong. Visai, he he dodged his WBC Vada drug test, and then fought two times in Thailand, and he comes back, and everybody's talking about yeah. the Charlo what great, brothers. What Remember great, the Charlo what brothers? Matchup it is. And Charlos yeah. did the same thing. So wrong, Visai did. Yeah. So it's either let and, them all uh, do it, or at some point. You got to make somebody an example here to set a precedent so people will stop doing this. So, I mean, in the end, I mean, it just the entire sport of boxing right now sickens me. I mean, the shit gets it's old. Like, yeah. I mean, you, you got to pay. Is- yeah, you got to pay for shit with Canelo and Jacobs. The undercard is crap. I mean, I'm it's only horrible. paying 10 bucks, so I don't care that much. But. You know, you're going to charge me as a boxing fan for Terrence Crawford and Amir Khan? Do you think I'm stupid? You obviously do. But then again, from looking at people on Facebook and the posts they make about boxing, I think that it's a safe assumption to say that most boxing fans, especially under the 30, are pretty much stupid, Jeremiah. 
Well, yeah, I, I wanted to touch on something real quick, too. It's, the, the problem with the sport, obviously, and again, the hardcore boxing fans should get this. When you have, you know, four entities who are crowning quote-unquote world champions, when things like this happen, you have to have them work in unison, right? They all have to say, hey, you can't fight for my title. But when it comes to the money, uh, you know, they're, they're willing to throw their morality out the door and, you know, and, and caution the win and let these guys carry on. I mean, that's the problem. You don't have a commissioner laying down sentences that are universal. This, this is a problem, and it's always, it's always going to be a problem until the shit changes. And I, I know you guys are a bit more cynical about that, well, especially you, Mike, a bit more cynical about that than I am. I think things can change. It just take, you know, a, a heavy hand. But, yeah, I mean, it, it, but it's going to carry on. It, it's going to carry on because this is the model that we have. I mean, you've got to give credit. As, as much as I don't like the guy, you've got to give credit to Gilberto Mendoza Jr. for actually doing something. Uh, you know, he was pretty proactive in his stuff. Yeah, but he there. had a chance to but, have the heavy hand here. And he knows the uh, well, six, he knows the six he knows the six months isn't going to do anything. Of course, no, of course. I, I do but what I'm saying that. is, at I, least... I, I think here's here's even I, I've said it a lot of times. I'll still say it because this is again a perfect example. As fraud as they might be, the New York and the Nevada State Athletic Commission in the United States have the best chance to do something in the sport because no, no nobody else has any power where they're really going to do anything uh, or they don't want to. So here's what probably should happen that, that would take care of some of this. New York, right, New York denied him the license to fight when he tested positive um, on the multiple occasions. That's Jarrell Miller. So what I would think would be the solution that you should have is New York should say, because we deny, you know, you know he, he's not eligible for a license in New York, say, for a year or two, uh, because, you know, we had to deny him a license because he failed tests and then Nevada recognizes that suspension, which they will recognize each other under some of those U S you know, boxing commission agreements, which the U S had made a little bit of progress with that. Cause Mike, remember, you know, years ago when we were first following the sport and you would have these guys that would, it's not even funny, but would get knocked out, you know, like in, in Oklahoma and be fighting. <laughs> Yeah, Craig Howe. You're talking about day. Craig Howe, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> and he'll fight under yeah, an assumed fighting. name, and then someday he'll make a tour around the country as a former world right. champion. Exactly. And then they started recognizing these suspensions, and that actually worked. That did clean up a lot of that stuff. So, you know, you can't shame the rest of the world. That's the thing. Like, if, if you know, Jarrell Miller, you know, wanted to show up there, in, I, you know, I'm not – in some country overseas – they're not going to be able to stop that, but he's an American. Uh, you know, he, he's had all his fights in the U S that's going to hurt him. So, you know, something like that would probably, I, I'd like to see maybe something like that because, you know, it is right. Technically that, okay, he didn't have a New York license. So it wasn't suspended, but they obviously denied his application. And there's a reason for that. that he tested positive. So I don't see why there couldn't be reciprocity on that. And if New York said he's not eligible to even apply for a license for say a year or two or something like that. And then I could recognize that would probably do it, but it'd have to be something like that. The alphabet organizations aren't going to do it. All right. Um, so you know. how about this? Let's go to something else that just pisses me off. And Jeremiah, should I ask John the question that nobody's been able to answer for me for the last four weeks? To ask away, man. All ask right. Away. This is my question. I ask everybody this. Nobody could ever answer it for me. How is it? The Deontay Wilder's mandatory challenger is Dominic Brazil, who's ranked number four. Yeah, that's abs- it's absurd. There's no doubt about <laughs> see? it. See, he can't um, answer I, it either. I, I'm out of people. Well, no, Maybe I, I John Scully tomorrow. I, here, here, was, here, here was how I, – I don't know how they worked it this way, but when, when – and this was absurd at the time. For some reason, when it still is. Brazil fought Eric Molina, that was a – the WBC eliminator, you know, for the for the title shot, and then somehow along the way, I remember Dillian White also being you know being ranked number one, but because Brazil won this eliminator, I guess with more. I mean, this is all absurd, of course. <laughs> yes, it don't is. Don't get me wrong, but I believe that's supposedly why Brazil was is getting this shot. But that's all made up. We know that. 
I mean, yeah, I'm and that. I that's mean, I, the problem I, I have yeah. with all of this. So now we're going to watch Deontay Wilder fight Dominic Brazil. We're going to watch Tyson Fury fight Tom Schwartz, who I think did my taxes last year. And then we're going to have Anthony Joshua fight Andy Ruiz. Now, the scary part of all of this is I think Andy Ruiz might be the best of the three, John. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, Brazil has provided some action, but, you know, I mean, none of these fights are what we should be getting. Make no mistake about it. I, I like, you know, I didn't get to chime in on the podcast yet. I mean, under these circumstances, I ended up liking Ruiz as a substitute opponent because yeah. he just fought He just fought on Fox. It was a low rate in the sense that not as high as some of the other PBC broadcasts, but a million saw him. And with boxing today, that's a lot more than they're seeing anybody else. And like it or not, it's a lot more than they're seeing the people on the zone. So, um, you know, he's been seen and, uh, you know, he's got, you know, he's born in California, you know, Mexican. I mean, uh, Canelo is going to be fighting, you know, this weekend on the zone. So there's a nice tie in there for the next month. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot more Mexican Americans and Mexicans in New York. So you've got, you know, some traditional boxing ethnic following there. And Ruiz has some skills, you know, Dimitri Anko didn't provide any resistance, but what Ruiz did in there looked good. You know, he's moving his head. He's got fast hands. And you know, I know Jeremiah said it favorably about Ruiz for a long time. And, yeah. You know, you could see the skills there. So He'll be good till he gets tired. Like, yeah, he's not like an incompetent guy he's going in there. If, if Ruiz, if he comes really with the commitment to use those skills, I'm not going to predict it definitely will be, but it, it could be it could be an interesting fight for a while. Um, you know, we're, you know, it's not a, a certainty, but it could be. And Ruiz is in shape because he just fought. So in today's boxing, that's probably a good thing. So especially with Ruiz. So it, it, it's, it's okay. Um, you know, Brazil, the problem with Brazil is, you know, he's got no, you know, his skill level is just not good. He's got no defense. You know, he couldn't yeah. get anything. And he hasn't beaten Joshua. anybody either. You know, he, I mean, He's beaten some guys that, you know, I'm not saying he, he hasn't beaten a legit top 10 contender. There's no Monsoor is a decent he, fighter. Um, Molina right. is a guy that he, can he, take he, a he, massive he, ass no, whooping. No. Oguna, Oguna was undefeated and considered a pretty good prospect. That was a good fight. You know, he had to grit it out for that. You know, Negron actually had one bad loss, but he came to fight against them, and he's got some skills. Again, these are not top 10 guys, but... It's, it's, we've seen worse in terms of opposition, but but uh, and, you know he was in there with Joshua. He got dominated, but he he didn't quit. But um, but you know he, he gets hit. You know Wilder's not as good defensively as as Joshua, I would say. So you know Brazil does have some power, but I, I didn't want this fight. Hey, I, I mean I actually like Wilder in Brazil, but I don't think this is the direction Wilder should have gone. Even if he's not going to be able to fight Fury and Joshua, I thought he should have gone with. The Ortiz rematch in Tanatsky, which I think are going to be rumors now this week, his next two fights, but I don't think they should be the next two. I think they should be starting now. Um, um, but, how about yeah. this? We talk about Ortiz. I think this is absolutely crazy that he's not fighting Joshua for $5 million. And he's asking for 10 That's the thing I think is really crazy. If he would have just came out and said, I'm going to wait because I'm going to get to fight Wilder next, I'd have been all right with that. But to sit here and say that he was lowballed when I haven't seen any credible sources say that he was lowballed. I'm not certain exactly what's going on there, except that I, I agree like everybody else. But I, I'm with you, Mike. I don't have a problem with it. I, I think, you know, he's going to get the wild to fight. Um, and I think that fight's going to – I've said that for a couple months, you know. And I think we've kind of said that, too. Again, it's not that we don't want something else, but when you really look at it, this is where Wilder is going to gain, for, you know, if he doesn't stumble against Brazil, which he shouldn't. He's going to gain a little more momentum, like it or not, I, I think, than, than some people might think. You know, if he fights Tanatsky and Barclays and he has a rematch with Ortiz, you know, if his showtime rating's decent against Brazil, we don't know if it will be, but it might be. He's going to probably make – they're all probably going to make some money, and those fights are probably going to do pretty well, um, you know. And uh, then, you know, Joshua and Fury are going to have to be looking for opponents. Well, they've got each other, so. Jeremiah? Yeah, if push comes to shove, they do have each other. I mean, 
You know, that's to me, that's the biggest heavyweight matchup in the uh, And I still think the this is right the way now. that's I mean, headed, Jeremiah. I think that's why Tyson Fury didn't fight Wilder yet. Dude, I don't know, man. I feel like I'm watching a like a like a box boxing's version of Game of Thrones or something. You know what I mean? It's like it's all these there's all these I mean, but the twists and turns are not nearly as intricate or in, interesting. I mean, it's no. just it's a lot of no, not even close. I mean, it's it's a lot of posing and posturing, and I understand I understand this is prize fighting and these guys want to make money. I get it, man, but it just feels so drawn out. You know, it's this three-headed dragon, and, you know, two of them need to be cut off. I need to know who the man is, and, uh, you know, and this is the thing is, you know, with with Wilder, you know, potentially making good money against Konaki. I mean, because he, he will make good money against oh, Konaki. Oh, Konaki in New York is going to be huge. Yeah. I'm because right. of Konaki. Yeah. It's going to be, big. Yeah, it's gonna be right? big. And then Anthony, jo- no matter who Anthony Joshua fights, he's going to make a boatload of cash. And then, you know, uh, Tyson Fury just got his big deal, so... You know, he's going to be rolling in dough for a little while, too. So, it's, again, I'm not even sure where to go with this it stuff. It takes because, all the incentive you know, away for them to fight each other. It, it, it does. Well, and that's that's the problem with the game anymore. It's like you, you have all the – like back in the day, right? I mean, yeah, guys like Harry Greb used to fight, you know, you know, 40 times a year. But that's because he, he didn't have access to all these revenue streams like you do today. I mean, could you imagine how rich – Somebody like Muhammad Ali would be in today where, you know, you oh, generate mad revenue. Could you imagine what Ali Frazier won in this day would have done money-wise, Jeremiah? It, it, would, it, would, it would have smashed it. Again, we were, we were talking about Ali Spinks, too, and how, was, you know, the worldwide audience was $2 billion. I, I People right. need to put this into perspective, man. It's like, oh, well, we're doing decent pay-per-view numbers against so-and-so and yada, yada, yada. Dude, Ali Spinks. Just in America, virtually all of house, every t- household that had a TV, nearly half of everybody was watching Ali Spinks too, and two billion people worldwide. That that that, that, 70, that 70 million that, seventy million in the U.S. On yeah, TV. but also yeah, you got to realize this too, though, Jeremiah. Same thing could be said about every other sport. Nineteen seventy-five World Series. You had like 85 million people watch it. I still think the most watched Super Bowl was Super Bowl 16. I mean, so those numbers have dropped off. But the thing is, in boxing, the reason those numbers dropped off is not because of oversaturation, ESPN, and all that. The reason the numbers have dropped off in boxing is because you don't have those kind of personalities to generate that anymore. Exactly. And this is a, this is a thing. This is, I think, to another point that we constantly make is that these guys are doubling down on the systems that they've been they've, that been put in place for years, right? So with guys like Sugar Ray Leonard, he was able to make a, a, a bunch of money out of the gate because he, you knew who he was before he even became a professional. And oh, yeah. That's the way it was with a lot of these guys, right? You were brand building. I, I've, I've talked about this a lot lately, John. But, you know, NBA, NFL, they do a good job of brand building, right? You, you have a lot of players who are culturally relevant because – you know, the ease of access to some of these guys, you know, the way that NBA markets, right? Boxing doesn't do much of that at all. Again, there, there, there have been some good cases like Deontay Wilder getting in front of the CBS crowd uh, during the, uh, I, I can't remember final which four, one yeah. it was. The final, yeah, the final four, right? It was almost 14 million people. That's good, right? But you're just not getting enough of that in boxing. We're not getting enough. You're building right. these guys. No, you look at Errol Spence. Errol Spence may be a, he he might have been a great welterweight. Maybe he will be a great welterweight. We don't know. But had you put him in Texas a long time ago, you you you, you know you talk, give him the interviews, put a mic in front of his face before he even gets to a professional game, you could have done a lot more with the guy. I mean, we see. I, I mean, I hear this from boxing insider, insiders pretty regularly, actually, about how the Texas scene is burgeoning, right? There, there's a lot of, lot to like there. You look at the Charlo brothers, Spence, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and not only that, I have heard from people Figuero- who are Figueroa Garcia. Figueroa. Yeah, well, and I've heard from the people who uh, were at the Errol Spence, Mikey Garcia pay-per-view that there were surprisingly amount of Spence fans that showed up, right? And then you got the converts from the pay-per-view. But anyways, the sport's just not brand building enough. And you can't brand build enough if you're not constantly playing the best of the best. Right, I can see. Again, I know who's going to play in the. Well, I, I'm going to get to watch the best play the best in the NHL 
uh, Stanley Cup. Yeah, you're going to watch it everywhere except for observe. boxing. Exactly, right? Uh, you know, we're playing the waiting game with, uh, you know, with just about all these guys, and, and it's unfortunate. I mean, this is the kind of shit that ruins the sport. And I think John might have been on when I brought this up the last time, but look at the momentum we've lost. Because you know, the anniversary was not that long ago. It was a few days ago where you had Vladimir Klitschko and Anthony Joshua, and he had that little anniversary. It got a lot of hype, one fight of the year and a lot of publications, and then what's been done since? I mean, again, it's just constantly shooting itself in the foot. Well, it got ruined. And it got, yeah, it got ruined. You know, we were in decent shape after Wilder and Fury fought, and it got, just got all ruined. 2019 has been well, bad. It was the same thing two years ago, John, when Joshua and Klitschko fought, and they let it get away both times. Yeah. Well, that's true. They didn't follow up then, and now they didn't follow up again. But actually, when Jeremiah was talking about uh, the, the Olympians in 76, it reminded me of something, which is, again, something that, some fans today just don't get, even that follow it hardcore. Now, it's a good example. It just reminded me of something. Let's think about the Olympics in 76 when Sugar Ray Leonard, the Spinks brothers, Howard Davis were all on uh, ABC fighting for medals. They, they, they were kids going against basically professionals in, in, the, in the rounds for the gold medals. They they weren't in there with a no hope. They weren't in there with a no hope for on national TV with a one and one and five record with, because they had to be built up and not take a loss. They were on the line having to show what they had to win, and then, like Jeremiah said, everybody knew who they were even before they turned pro. But yeah. in other words, it's risk reward. You take a risk. You you perform. You get a reward. It's not you fight no hopers and you get exposed with no hopers and then people want to see you fight. They keep touting that, but it just doesn't work that way. I mean, you gotta people got to see in a fight that matters when you're challenged and, and you know you're you're being threatened. And we're just not getting that nowadays. Yeah, Sugar Ray Leonard, John, if you remember, was fighting guys ranked in the top ten before his tenth fight. Right. I mean, he was fighting. He fought Marcus Geraldo, a middleweight. Yeah. On his way up to fight for well, the welterweight title. I think we got guys who wasn't his second fight. Wasn't his second fight like Willie Fireball Rodriguez, who was ranked at the bottom of the top ten at the time. Yeah, I mean he, the, these guys were right. These guys were moving up a lot faster than these fans today realize. You know, I mean, you know, of course, we all know about Leon Spinks. Hey, but how about <laughs> this, real Leon quick? Bef- before I forget this point, John, could that be because of the way they were built in the amateurs? Because Sugar Ray Leonard was making forty thousand dollars at his pro debut. You're not going to put him making that amount of money in 1977 against a guy that's three and eighteen because people aren't going to buy it. But the problem now is the thing I remember about seventy six and eighty four. If you remember before Leonard fought, or in eighty before before Pernell Whitaker or Vander Holyfield or whoever it was on that team fought, you'd get a five minute you know review of their life, what got them there, and there would be a connection with the fans, which is what got them that money. But when you get that money, that amount of money at the start of your career, you got to fight people. I mean, Roy Jones right. Jr. Um, I remember him fighting some guys that were pretty good in these first 10 or 12 fights when he had a couple of those on NBC. Yeah, Mike, you made the key there, and I think that's what people are missing is we want, you know, if you follow the sport enough, I think most people want the fighters to get paid. But it's, it's then we want you to get paid, but then you've you got you to gotta do something for it. Exactly. Like yeah, you got to earn it. It was common sense. Right. It was common sense back in past decades that, you know, yeah, you're you're gonna get paid good, but then you gotta fight. But it's like you said, and you're you're absolutely right. You gotta fight somebody. You know, we're not gonna pay you that money. Like you know, why? Look, Terrence Crawford's you know a, a good to great fighter. You know, Amir Khan was done. You know, why should why should Terrence Crawford get paid a lot of money to fight Amir Khan? And it's not that I don't want Terrence Crawford to make a lot of money. It's the point of it's it's not a it's not a worthy opponent at this stage of his career. You know, I mean. You, you fight somebody to get that money. Um, and, and, you know, we can apply that to a lot of situations, but that's that's the problem. I mean, sure, have Terrence Crawford on the pay, pay-per-view when he's fighting somebody. <laughs> not, a guy, not a guy that's a massive underdog that's got no chance. Yeah, because really, outside of the guys that, you know, Pacquiao and all those guys that are in that same group, they're going to fight Spence. There's really nobody you can put Crawford in in a pay-per-view card against and it'd be worth it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, 
you know, that, that's where you got to look at reality, too. And that doesn't mean it's Terrence Crawford's fault. It's just like when sometimes earlier in Wilder's career, people would criticize Wilder. It's the state of boxing today. But, you know, Terrence Crawford has had a pay-per-view shot against Postal, and he's had a pay-per-view shot against Tom, and the numbers have been buried. And, and I agree, yeah, Mike. Right. You know, it doesn't mean he won't sell against Errol Spence. Were there numbers on Crawford is, Con? Did everybody, anybody hear him? They, 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 there's a rumor that it's 150, which would probably be generous. You mean 150, you know, been, right? You're right, yeah. And there's okay. been no release of the numbers. Yeah. So we, we, I, we I, yeah, I, I did. No, We're not I talking 150,000, right? We're talking about legitimately 150. That's my guess. <laughs> it could be. Well, right off, 150,000. Okay. Yeah, now Rick Rick Glazer actually said that uh, it was 179, but we know you know Rick Glazer and his top rank bias. Now you mean 179, just 179 people, right? Because I no, find that hard to believe that that many people watch that. No, but he like means 179. He tries, he tries to he tries to talk up top rank, and even he only said 179. So once again, that's just 179. <laughs> Because <laughs> I really can't believe that 179,000 people would have bought that. And does Rick Glazer think no. people got their money's worth? Well, well, we got we got to back up a little bit because I think that Crawford was really. I don't think he was the sell there. I actually think that they were hoping. Oh that yeah, I think so too. Name. So you might have had 170. You might have had a a hundred thousand Pakistanis by that. Uh, I mean, I don't know if they had pay per view there or whatnot, but. Yeah, maybe maybe they were thinking that com- com- his combined popularity in the UK and Pakistan would do it for him, but uh, I mean that, that number still seems too damn high for me. Well, well, they're only talking U.S. numbers, but I think I don't know on uh, this one. It's just anecdotal, but I, I don't know on this one even, and make people are probably embarrassed, but I don't remember anybody even on Twitter actually saying they bought this. No, because nobody would admit it, it if they did. <laughs> right, nobody was going to. It would be like that time that. that I bought McGregor and Mayweather, and then claimed everybody I didn't do that. Yeah, I bought it. I, I had to get to that. I know, I it. but uh, I will never admit to this because I didn't buy it, and I'll post my cable bill on too. Um, yeah, and you, you brought up Wilder. I mean, the same thing. How can you be a heavyweight champion in the world when you've never beaten anybody? You shouldn't get a shot at it. And that's not to take a shot at him, but I mean. Jason Gavern, Malik Scott, Nikolai Fertha, Sergey Lyahovich, which would have been a great win seven years before that. Oddly Harrison, he fought nobody. And the problem with that is this, and this is not me taking a shot at Wilder. I'd love to take shots at Wilder, but it's not. It's just if you're going to build him into being this pay-per-view attraction that everybody knows, his fight before he fights for the title should not be against 25-16 and 16 Jason Gavern. And the fight before that shouldn't be Malik Scott. At some point, you have to fight somebody to get people interested. Well, that's why you know I, I, I don't. I think the, you know the heavy, the real heavyweight championship is vacant right now. You know, I, no doubt. I, I've always liked Wilder, and and uh, you know I, I I believe in him, but I've never advocated he was the champ, and we know that. And I don't advocate that Joshua is, nope. or, or you know Fury's claim. You know he. he he was away. gone too long. And, that, and, and that's been poor. And that's been part of the chaos in boxing is, you know, to me, even though, I mean, I mean, to me, you know, it, it was whittled down already. And then, you know, we talked about this. It's been a couple of years. But this is how bad this stuff keeps getting. You know, then your, your three, grand, you know, three of your, your traditional divisions, most well-known, you know, of course, he, heavyweight, light heavyweight and middleweight. You know, you had, even though, again, I, I like Canelo, but you had Canelo fighting for the, the Rooney middleweight title at catchweight. You had Adonis Stevenson, who had a claim, you know, based on Chad Dawson, who Andre Ward had already knocked out, and then Stevenson wasn't fighting anybody. And you had Tyson Fury pick up the Rooney heavyweight title in the most boring Rooney heavyweight title fight of all time against Klitschko, and then have to take PEDs and not fight for two years, two and a half years. I think he took more than PEDs for those two and a half years. Too. Right, and he, by his own admission, yeah. And, and you know, so boxing as chaotic as it is got even into worse chaos because it, it became hard to even – even argue for for lineal champs and, and true champs and it's yeah because it's hard of, even to you know connect the lineal stuff all the way through history anymore because everything's been so splintered off 
Right, and I, I think to me that be, to me that became a big problem. You know, if you're a hardcore follower historian of the sport, that that you know, boxing with all its history, that's really really damaging. All right, do we want to go ahead and talk about Canelo and get this over with, and then we can go on and live our normal lives, Jeremiah. Canelo Alvarez against Daniel Jacobs. Now, I like this fight, and to me it comes down to this, Jeremiah. I think if Canelo finds a way to attack on the inside, he breaks Jacobs down, he wins an easy decision or stops him. On the other hand, I think if Jacobs can use the height and reach advantage, along with his movement to outbox Canelo from the outside, I think he could spring an upset. Do you agree with those two statements? Uh... Sort of. I mean, I, I do think that Alvarez, if he can work his way inside, I do think that he's given himself, a, you know, the best shot available. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't use the word easy. I mean, I, I do think that that will make things easier on him, but I, I wouldn't say easy. Well, I meant easier um, on him. Come on. Jesus. Okay. Well, John you say, you know, when... John's being nicer to me tonight. Go ahead. <laughs> No, but I mean, and I do think your your logic is correct with, uh, you know, the Daniel Jacobs thing. At least in terms of boxing and moving, it's just you know, I, it's it's going to be tough for him. I mean, he does have what four inches in height, three inches in reach, and I think naturally we all have the inclination to assume that that's what he's going to do, and maybe that is the case. I would like personally to see him go on the attack. I think he's a bigger guy. I think he's a stronger guy. Uh, again, I think he has good size. He's not a bad in-fighter, though, you know, Alvarez is the superior operator there. Uh, but I, I would like to see a bit more Peter Quillen type stuff in this matchup. You know, and again, I would too. I just don't t- think from what I've seen before that he's going to do that. I, I don't think so either, but maybe that's why we get that. Again, there are surprises occasionally. Again, when Canelo Alvarez fought aggressively against Kennedy Golovkin, that surprised just about everybody. Yeah, so, but I've seen again, Canelo be aggressive before. I just, with Jacobs, I don't remember too many fights where he just went after somebody. No, no I, I wouldn't say went after them, you, you know, like a guy like Golovkin does. Jacobs doesn't really seem to like the press it seems like if he likes if he wants to get aggressive he'll keep you in the center of the ring if he respects what you have he has a tendency to circle and uh so again but i would still again i, I want to see him like he was against peter quill and i want to see him throw throw bombs i mean i want to see him get aggressive get physical push canelo off and, and unleash his hands i mean to me he's the hand speed is, is pretty close. I mean, uh, you know, the the difference really is probably more about timing than anything else. And I would say that Alvarez does have better timing than, than Danny Jacobs. But I do think Danny Jacobs has better one-punch power than Canelo Alvarez. And I know Alvarez has looked iron shin against Kennedy Golovkin, but it's not as if he's impossible to knock out. I mean, we, we saw Randall Tex Cobb, you know, get beat up and, and you know, stopped in a round by uh, – I don't remember who was the guy from Texas, or I can't remember what the hell it was. Tex Cobb got mean, stopped like in the a, first round? Yeah, didn't he? Like, later in his career, he got stopped in the first round by a guy. When he got old, he got knocked out a few times. But that's because I think the accumulation from everybody else beating his head in might have done some. I don't remember. Do you remember Tex getting knocked out in the first round by anybody? I, I would just say, like you guys were both saying, I think maybe maybe late in his career. Yeah, I know um, late in his career know, he did. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, well, you know, like, like this, you, can, you take too I'm many thinking. shots after a while. Yeah, but, but, yeah, you finally get broke George, down. And, unless you're yeah. George Chivalo, you know, your, your, your chin's going to – even Jake LaMotta got knocked down late in his career, that light heavyweight. But, well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, Jake LaMotta, he was on – I think he got stopped by uh, – I know I thought I saw him rocked against Irish Bob Murphy. Uh, but even Chivalo, I, he got stopped by Foreman. He was hurt in that fight. What I'm saying is I, I don't know – if Canelo Alvarez is George Chavallo or if he's Jake LaMotta or if he's Marvin Hagler, he might be. Um, you know, I think he was pretty good at not taking a lot of clean, hard punches from Golovkin. And, uh, you know, again, it's, a lot of this can also be about timing. But I want to see that Jacobs. Again, if he boxes Wait a second. Moves, uh, I've, I've got to bring this up real quick. 
Um, do you remember Tex Cobb fighting Buster Douglas, John? It's not come. I mean, not not right off the top. Because I went head, to so. Box Rack in 1984. It says James Douglas. I don't know if it's the same one or not. Seventeen two and one. You know, uh, Tex Cobb lost a majority decision to him. That sounds right, mm-hmm. though. It is Douglas, the same well, one too. I believe. Under, Douglas was wow. really under the radar. Under the radar for a yeah, while. Yeah, it was. He he barely beat yeah. Tex Cobb on a split decision in 1984, and then Cobb lost that rematch to Dokes in '85. But yeah, sorry about that, Jeremiah. I just didn't remember that. I got to see if Daniel Cisneros has it on DVD. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's probably an interesting, you know, worth watching too. But now. What I'm afraid of is if Daniel Jacobs has to box and move, I think he's got to play spoiler a little bit because, like you said, you know, Alvarez is going to try to infight. He's going to try to bang the body, slow him down. You know, uh, Devaranchenko had some success there. And so, again, I, I just don't want to see him play the spoiler. I don't want him to jab and, you know, try to land a right hand and grab and, and you know, reset and do it all over again. I want to see him be aggressive. And I think his best shot is a knockout, frankly. All right. John, what's your take on this fight? I mean, to me, I just want to know if he's going to be more aggressive. I kind of agree with Jeremiah there. When I say by using his size, I think he's got to use that size by punching, though. And I don't. I, his last three fights for Jacobs, I mean, if we would have been talking about this fight in 2017, I would probably be picking Jacobs. But when you look at what Jacobs has done... I mean, Selecki, Luis Arias, Devrinchenko, he did not look real good against them. Well, I, I, I think I don't, I don't normally like punch stats, but I found them interesting in recent years from Jacobs um, because what I like him for is and, – and when you watch Jacobs fight, you don't really notice it with the naked eye, but, but it's, it's one of those deals where the stats don't necessarily lie. I don't like it. I don't like punch stats as pro boxing for deciding who wins the fight. I think they're useless for that, but – I like it for activity level, and, and Jacobs throws far less punches than the average middleweight. So it, it doesn't seem like, you know, because he's got boxing skills and he's got power, so when you watch him, it, it, you don't necessarily notice it, but he, he doesn't throw that many punches. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's a potential problem for him. I see it a little bit like you, Mike, except the only thing that I think I see differently, and this is the part I see like Jeremiah, is – I see it more like, you know, Jacobs' punch rate's a bit down, so uh, he is bigger than Canelo, though. And Jacobs really, as his career has gone on, punching harder and harder as a middleweight. You know, he's got the first-round stoppage of Quillen. You know, he, he dropped Suljeki. He, he dropped uh, Derek Vinchenko. I mean, the guy's got power. Um, you know, Golovkin and Canelo probably have the two best chins in boxing, so he, he couldn't uh, – he couldn't drop the Canelo, I mean, excuse me, Golovkin with some clean, a couple clean shots. But like uh, Jeremiah said, and I agree, you know, that, that was a fight that Jacobs was, he seemed to be afraid to set down on against Golovkin. Uh, he, he just wanted to kind of circle around more, and, and he wasn't setting down on his punches as much as he usually would. But he's convinced me he's got a lot of power for the middleweight division, but his punch rate's that high. So what that leads me to believe is, I think there's, even though Canelo's really got a great chin at this point, anybody can theoretically be knocked out. And, you know, if Jacobs can keep him on the end of his punches, uh, you know, he, he, maybe he gets, maybe he can get a big shot in and, and, you know, hurt him bad and turn the tide of the fight or, or stop him. I don't think that's going to happen, but I think it's his best shot because you look at Canelo against guys like Angulo and, and Angulo, even though he was fading, you know, the, the guy is a good puncher. Um, you know, Canelo was boxing him. Um, you know, you know, Canelo will do that sometimes too. You know, when he thinks a guy's got some power, you know, he, he you know, he did it in the first fight with Golovkin, you know, he'll get into boxer mode too. But I think even though Canelo's boxing skills are really good, where I see where Jacobs might get have a chance here is if Canelo gets into that boxer mode and even though he's the shorter guy, he tries to stay outside and just box Jacobs and Jacobs catches him on the end of anything, but but I see it like you guys do that, you know, I think if Canelo uses his boxing skills to get inside, I'm not sure that he will, but if he does, uh, you know, he'll, he'll probably outwork Jacobs and get a decision. And, and Canelo's skilled enough. I think it's possible he could do that from the outside, 
But I think if he does it from the outside, he's going to give Jacobs his one chance to win. And that's kind of the way I'm seeing it. I, I think that Canelo, you know, will, will win a decision either way it goes. But, but Jacobs has convinced me he hits hard enough at middleweight that even in a guy with a great chin like Canelo, if Canelo sits there on the outside trying to box, Jacobs got some skill. You know, it's not impossible Jacobs could catch him or something. But I, I think Canelo, by decision, is the way I see this going. All right. So, Jeremiah, how do you think this ends? I have Alvarez by decision. Do you think he'll win, or do you think he'll just get the decision? No, I mean, he's getting the decision either way. So, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, I mean, I, I do think that what it kind of, kind of comes down to to me is uh, John makes a good point about Jacob's work rate and, and the fact that, you know, he will allow guys like Devrinchenko and and others to, you know, to work their way in. And, you know, even at mid-range, they had some success. Uh, Devrinchenko, however, was at his best when he was body punching. To me, what I boil it down to is, is you know, when we're, we're talking about two guys like this, it seems like Alvarez is just, he has better timing. He just has a better sense of when to do it and when not to do it. And I think, I think that's the difference, right? I think he's better with his feints. I think he's just a bit more creative with his offense. So, again, I, I think it will be, you know, a, a pretty close decision win in his favor. But, again, I wouldn't be surprised by any result here. All right. You guys got anything else you want to talk about? I'm going to take the decision, Canelo. But we, we do else, have a John? good fight. And we, yeah, Peter we have Biev. a good fight that's worth it. Peter Biev and Kalajic is a good fight. Even the odds makers are not viewing it as that good of a fight. But I don't. this is one that I don't. I, I never discount what the odds makers say, but you know I think Kalajic's been under the radar screen. I like this, I like this fight. Um, I think there's a chance for an upset here, but it's hard to just go straight out pick Kalajic. I don't have a strong feeling on this one because I think Kalajic's got a shot, but I do like a lot of the abilities and the power beater Biev brings, even though his career has undoubtedly stalled some in recent years. The guy's even at 34, he might not be what we thought he was going to be, but he's still got sort of enough upside when maybe he feels like he's pressed with a guy like Kalajic that, you know, he can explode on you with some big power and, and knock out anybody. So I like the fight. I'm going to be watching both fights. I, I don't want to miss this Peter Biev and Kalajic fight either. Uh, I do like it. I think it'll, I think it'll cut into the Canelo Jacobs fight more on his own than people think, because it'll appear to hardcore fans and there'll be some who don't have his own who will say, eh, I'll just watch the, Peter B.F. Kalajic fight on ESPN for my regular basic cable rate. So I don't know if the zone can afford to have much bleeding and what they're hoping to get for subscribers on this. So there's the, the TV business intrigue part of that, too. Not that more people won't watch uh, Canelo Jacobs, but it might not be by as much as you think. Um, because Peter B.F. got $1.4 million the last time he was on ESPN. And, you know, that's a that's a pretty good number for the way boxing's going nowadays. So, you know, DAZN's subscriber rate's been rumored going into this fight to be like 250,000 or something like that. So, you know, they got to pick up a lot. So you got that. Uh, I, I like, you know, that's an interesting fight. Uh, Jeremiah recently profiled the light heavyweight punchers. That, that was good and interesting because, as he pointed out, I like the division because it's got a lot of talent. And it's got a lot of big bangers. And these light heavyweights today – that don't have to weigh in the day of the fight coming in at the weights they are uh, probably over 185. I mean, you know, one shot, that's why there's so many knockdowns, you know, in light heavyweight nowadays, one shot can knock down and knock out anybody. So when you got two guys like this in there, uh, that's a, that's a fight with a chance for some, some fireworks. All right, Jeremiah, anything before we go, you want to talk about beater B of or anything else? Yeah, no, I, I think John's on the money with this fight. Cause, uh, Kalajic is a good fighter. I mean, he's been kind of uh, he's been kind of doormat. I, I know I know he's been fighting still. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure how active he's been, but I know he's had a few fights since the uh, the Marcus Brown fight, and a lot of people thought that he won. I mean, he knocked Marcus Brown in that one. He did get knocked down himself, by the way. But it, it when you looked at the overall damage, it seemed like Kalajic was the it's a better man there. Like when you compare the two knockdowns. Well, how like about this, Jeremiah? How much do you like Kalajic? Because he's plus six twenty in this fight. Oh, I, 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 I gotta admit that I, I think it might be worth betting some money on because 
Uh, Peter B is a good fighter. I do like him. But I, I know some guys that got a little out of hand with their praise of him. You know, I even had some guys who were like, oh, yeah, this is why Andre Ward uh, retired. He's that scary. You know, you heard, he's got all these amateur stories, you know, where he was this, this feared puncher. You know, and he beat Kovalev a couple of times. And, uh, I think John Scully even told me that he stopped Gavodzic in the amateurs. And, they, and yeah. again, that's all good and well. Right, what you do in the amateurs is fine. It, it counts for something, but this is a professional game. And to me, Peter Biev just doesn't look like the big scary monster that a lot of people are counting him as. He seems to rely on his hooks uh, more than the other guys. Whereas you know, Dmitry Bivol, you know, he sticks to his straight punches a lot. So does Kovalev. So does Gavadzic. You know, Gavadzic to me is a bit more fluid. Peter Biev, out of all of those guys, seems like he has the shoddiest defense and probably the worst chin of the bunch, which to me, again, watching him get knocked down by Caleb Johnson was, was, you know, showed a little something. And it's not the, it's not the first time that Peter Biev has been hurt either. Um, he got dropped by, he me, got dropped by that Jerry Page guy, club fighter type guy. Correct. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> right. And, and so to me, that just seems to indicate that one of these days we're going to have Peter Biev stopped. And Kaladzic's a pretty good fighter. I mean, he didn't have all – you can't boast about you know, all the amateur credentials that a lot of these guys have, but he's got good size. You know, he's pretty long. Uh, he's got good variance in his offense. Uh, his defense is pretty good. Uh, to me, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him win this fight by knockout. I, I think it's going to be pretty damn interesting. I favor Peter Biev, but I do think it's probably per- worth putting a little down. Especially plus 620. Um, yeah, I, would I know, say, man. I would say this. Would you look at Jacobs Canelo? If I was going to bet that fight, John, I'd bet Jacobs. It's plus 355. Canelo's minus that, 460. A, I, I agree. That's the thing. I think Canelo's going to win, but, but you know, let's, let's talk about it. we got my bookie AG here, and it is interesting to handicap fights. I like to do it. Yeah, I, I agree with both of those calls. I mean, I'm not going to – I actually, you know, I think Canelo's going to win, and I'm not sure about Beater, Beev, and Kalajic, but I have to agree with, with both of you guys that, you know, if you're going to bet those fights, I mean, Jacobs is getting a pretty good price for, you know, he's the number two middleweight against Yeah, he's the almost four to one. Camp. Yeah, and, uh, and Kalajic, I've seen him in, in some sites, he's, he's minus, he, minus a thousand. I mean, uh, he's at like plus a thousand. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty good – I mean, for a guy – He's got his ability who, you know, like Jeremiah said, some people thought he beat Brown. I thought Brown pulled it out, but, but Brown was in bad trouble in that fight. And, uh, you know, now look what Brown did to Jack. So you've got that to look at. And, and Kalajic, you know, being that huge of an underdog, I mean, he's got some power. Beater B has been dropped. That's worth a shot. So, you know, anybody, uh, you know, you don't even have to put that much down on these guys to, to get some decent returns. So the, these are, uh, you know, especially Kalajic, it's, it's an attractive price. Yeah. All right, guys. Tomorrow night, we will have a special guest, Jeremiah John Scully, the Iceman, will be with us. That's a probable. He's still waiting. I guess he is in California for the fights, and he is helping train one of the fighters. He's trying to see what their schedule is for tomorrow. But as of right now, Scully will be in. If not, We'll talk to him at some point in the next two days. But tomorrow night, we'll be back live at 11. John, you're always invited at 11 o'clock, but I know you got to work the next day. Right. we got got that other job coming in. Yeah, in shilling right for here, PBC. Man, do you still do all the lawyering <laughs> stuff, too? Or have you made yeah. so much from PBC <laughs> that you just for, quit? For, for all, that's, that, that's what always makes me laugh. You know, for, for all this shilling for PBC I get paid for, you think I wouldn't be working any other job. Well, I mean, maybe you're just like a dirty whore and you're cheap. I mean, you never know. Yeah, I just, <laughs> yeah, I just want to make as much as I can, right? But, maybe uh, you're like Adelaide Bird. Yeah, they just give you like 100 bucks to go buy some new shoes and you'll do whatever they say. I don't know. I, I, it's, it's, I, I think, the, I think, I think the, like I said, I think the attackers are the ones getting the bucks. But uh, one, one of these days when I can stay up till 11, I'll have to uh, make an 11 o'clock appearance. All right. And then we'll be back Friday night to preview the fight. Probably with John Respani. I'll probably have to ask him first, but he'll probably do it unless he's going out with his lady friend. But, all right. Well, I'm going 
to go ahead and sign this off. I want to remind everybody to check out mybookie.ag. Also, check out the Retired Boxers Foundation with Alex Ramos and Jackie Richardson and Seat Giant, which you can get a 10% discount on your tickets if you put in a promo code LEGEND. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up. You can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, Zeno Live Radio Now, and 223 Now, other media outlets. So anywhere you can find podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. For Jeremiah Pricer, John Einreinhofer, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.